what I'll do is I think I'll just to you a little bit about what we're doing at Imperial College at the moment, and um, I'll go in a bit more depth into a few technologies, just seven technologies for, for accessing the brain. Um, so, so yes, here is where we're based in the Royal School of Bones Building, um, which is um, just off Exhibition Road in South Kensington, and, uh, and here's one of my experimental subjects in a little bottle of So, okay, neurotechnology. This is uh, um, it's the word we the word we're using to describe um, what we're doing, um, and we have a, a strategic initiative in neurotechnology which. Um, quite a few people in the college across a number of departments have been involved in. Is there what I mean by neurotechnology? Eh? So, so, I mean, the word's been used, used quite a bit recently, but specifically what, what we mean by it is um, technologies for advancing our understanding of the nervous system, new technologies for, for repairing or treating the nervous system, and technologies derived from understanding the brain. So these technologies might be, uh, they might range from consumer technologies to new algorithms which you might then go back and apply to understanding the brain again. So it is a kind of, you know, really sort of virtuous, virtuous circles here. So what is it that's sort of driven or driving the, the um, sort of recent growth of the area of neurotechnology? There are a few things, and this has been touched on earlier, uh, one of the main things is really demographics. So I should, so I should say it's really, a lot of it is, is medically driven, um, um, and specifically, in terms of the demographics, I and mean, as you all know, we've got an aging population. Um, so this is, these are sort of the UK figures from um, the government uh, sort of survey that uh, they right now is sort of sitting on sort of like 17 million people over the age of 50, and that's sort of growing rapidly. And not quite the fraction of people uh, over 50 is actually growing quite a bit as well. And as we know, um, problems with the brain are actually one of the, the a really increasing um, issue as we have an aging population. Um, so, so brain disorders cost us a lot, okay? And actually, you know, specifically look down here, um, this dementia one is probably most important. So this is these European things that were recently um, released. There's a, a paper in European neuropsychopharmacology. Um, Eight hundred. The numbers are big. Eight hundred billion euros per year. You know, the cost of um, the economic cost, let alone the social cost of brain disorders. And this dimensional one, which is really specifically the the aging, or one of the main aging oriented ones, is actually. Um, so you can see here, direct healthcare and direct medical. The direct costs here are over a hundred million. Um, sorry, 100 billion uh, euros per year. So, so these are huge numbers, and they are in the, well, certainly in the long term, I think going to drive um, a lot of sort of increased sort of need for neurotechnology research. Um, now, the, the final driver is really the complexity. Um, so, so you know, this organ here, the heart. We know how this code works, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we can build artificial ones. Um, we don't know how this one works. We've got you know, some vague glimmerings of understanding about how a very small fraction of cells in the primary visual cortex might be processing information, but we're really, we've just made, made just started working in orders there. So, so basically, we need technological solutions to basically do these things. So this is kind of what we've identified as a sort of a major strategic activity that um, we sort of launched in 2009, basically with sort of small amounts of internal funding and a lot of enthusiasm. Um, this is, I think, a, a two-year-old Wordle, which, I don't know if you know, this is a website, Wordle, you can basically give a text page, it will, it will give you a diagrammatic representation, weighted, with the words weighted by size, all of things are in there. So basically this was, um, was basically ripping the web pages of everybody involved and throwing them into Wordle and seeing what it came up with. And you can see new brains and new ones and information and techniques and fluorescence and computation and sort of various words uh, are involved here. So that's the kind of stuff that we do. Um, so basically we've been sort of hiring um, joint uh, staff and uh, in fact one of them is sitting over there, Carsten Murray, 
from the, a recent hire joint between the electrical engineering and bioengineering departments. And in fact, he and I are now uh, co-teaching a course on brain machine interfaces to uh, got a, a master's degree in neurotechnology, which is graduating about, um, I think we've got 15 or 16 students in the stream this year. Um, it's the third year of me running. Um, so we're teaching a brain machine interfaces course uh, uh, to those students, which I'll tell you a bit more later about later. Um, and we're basically sort of in effect of trying to leverage this group to build up, up you know, build up research in this area. Now the key, the key I think, difference um, is over things happening elsewhere. We really have a bunch of engineers and neuroscientists, and I mean real neuroscientists, experimental neuroscientists who um, you know, go in and do work experiments, are working together alongside each other at, at the lab bench. They're not just in different departments talking to each other. They're actually sort of working right next to each other. And, uh, and yeah, we're doing a, a bunch of different things. There are different technologies involved. I can just sort of highlight some, for instance, an example here, um, microelectromechanical systems. We have one advantage of having a, um, a microfabrication, silicon microfabrication facility in the electrical engineering department that's actually we've got a, sort of a lot of uh, things being launched with at the moment of you know, basically sort of new devices for probing the nervous system. And you know, other examples. We were talking a bit about two photo microscopy, uh, a, a technique for imaging the brain on uh, a basically sub <coughs> resolution, as well as traditional methods of imaging you know, whole brains. And then doing things like building robots based upon the understanding that we've gained. Okay, so technology for understanding the brain. So the way we're going to go through a, a few technologies, by no means a complete set. Uh, and I'll go through technologies for understanding the brain and also for sort of medical applications. And at the end, maybe touch on some sort of slightly longer term things, which I think are going to be very important. And hopefully, they should be at least enough to sort of launch a, a discussion. Um, so, technology for understanding the brain. Um, here's just some examples of sort of the different technologies we're doing. This is actually a slide from my colleagues, Ken Paris. Um, where we have, um, and we've got a similar setup in my lab, we've got actually a mouse running on a, a, a ball. This is an air levitated polystyrene ball. And the mouse is sort of sitting on this in a virtual reality environment. It's a sort of surround screen. So it runs on the ball, basically the, the environment moves accordingly. And um, thankfully, mice are a little bit stupid and they think this is just like the real thing. Um, so we uh, can record activity from from the mouse brain. And a lot of this research has been done in, in mice for reasons I'll, sort of, I'll, I'll come to. Um, but, you know, but not all, and it's extending towards me even humans. Um, so we can image brain activity, <coughs> we can record, we can use silicon micro machine electrodes to record the activity of many neurons, both well, of large numbers of neurons in this sort of local cortical circuit. And um, you know, we can develop algorithms for for analyzing that data. And this is actually a sort of a key limiting factor, I should say. You, know, you, you generate these sort of huge amounts of, sort of high dimensional data. Um, and actually analyzing that data is a non trivial task. We don't have really necessarily the right algorithm. I mean, it's easy to come up with algorithms that you have to do you know, a 10 year long experiment to be able to collect enough data to be able to sort of come, up with a, uh, come up with a conclusion. It's a lot harder to. Um, to have algorithms that you can use to analyze a, a two hour long experiment, which is what you're more likely to be faced with. And we, we then sort of record activity of many neurons simultaneously, as I was saying. So these are sort of spikes from, from, uh, from populations of neurons. So this is, this is done using electrical recording techniques. You can basically sort electrodes out in the extracellular space and listen to action potentials, which are the signals that neurons use to communicate with each other. Um, but increasingly, we're using imaging techniques to do the same kind of thing. So this is something from my lab. Um, this is actually a three-dimensional reconstruction of it. I'll show you a movie in a minute. What we do here is we basically load up the pet with dye. We basically insert the pet into the brain. We inject the dye, let's say, 300 microns deep into the brain. And over about half an hour, it's taken up into all of these neurons. And it's a calcium-dependent dye. So basically. The fluorescence of the cells after this time um, becomes dependent on the amount of calcium in them. And so if a neuron is firing an active energy, we get a calcium influx. So we can use this not only to see the structure in this visit detail, but also to look at, um, to look at neuronal activity. 
So basically, this is the sort of three-dimensional structure of the cerebellum. You can see the cell bodies about to get right, and this is the surface of the brain up there. And uh, actually, I mean, because this, is, this has been taken just for structural purposes, um, you can only really see it there, but the fluorescent, the, the intensity of these, of these pixels or voxels there actually uh, corresponds to the amount of calcium they've got inside them. And then we take a slice across that, what we might more, more typically do, we can basically look at um, basically sort of a little patch across here, and, and basically we've got the image of the cells going in this way, and basically looking at the dendrites of the neurons. So this is basically subcellular structures that are just a few microns across that we've been able to image in an intact brain, in principle in an animal, um, performing a task running on that ball, for instance. This was in an insect-like animal, but it's now been done in, in animals actually during behavior. This method has now been used in humans, just in a, um, I think, just one initial test uh, at Stanford University, with the idea of it being actually a, a method for very fine, um, um, fine scale imaging during uh, brain surgery. Um, just here's another couple of examples. We can actually combine our electrophysiological methods and our imaging methods together. So in red, you can see here, um, the contrast isn't great, I'm afraid. So basically, this is another patch of, our, um, of cerebellar brain circuitry here. And we've got a pipette actually sort of taken down and one over here. But we're actually, we can do recording under visual guidance. So in most of the history of neuroscience, we've been working blind. You know, now what we can do is we can basically see what we do. We can take an electrode down, we can touch it onto the side of a, of a given neuron um, that we visualize and record the activity. As we'll see later, we can actually target that genetically as well, which I think is incredibly powerful. To and so having done that, maybe you then, you know, we've done this for some control purposes. I mean, basically, so we'll see these calcium fluctuations which correspond to action potential for the neurons, basically the cells um, signaling to each other. So this technique, I mean it's, it is transforming I think the, the level of detail we're getting about the nervous system because you know, previously as I said, we've basically been recording blindly with electrodes and effectively sampling random neurons. I like to sort of make the analogy, if we if you took an integrated circuit and you wanted to sort of reverse engineer its functionality. And you basically drew lines across that circuit and recorded the voltage at random points on those lines. You, know, you wouldn't have a clue about being able to reconstruct how it would work, right? Um, but that's what basically you know, the last 100 or so years of the neuroscience has been doing. And if you did that, um, I mean, for instance, you might even measure the correlation in the activity between those different points as a function of distance. And you'd see these interesting cross correlation functions, just like we see in the nervous system, and maybe imply all sorts of interesting functionality to them, but you know, that wouldn't help you understand how that chip worked. And yet that's what we're trying to do um, in, in neuroscience. But now with these imaging techniques combined with actually some of these sort of genetic targeting techniques, we're actually look at the individual elements of the cortical circuit and sort of start to address how they interact together um, to compute. And we now so one of the limitations of two photo is it's traditionally been limited to about 500 microns or half a millimeter um, of the surface of the brain. Um, using some new techniques, basically, basically going to longer wavelengths, we're able to see deeper. Re longer wavelengths, is, it's kind of interesting. Um, up to about 1300 microns or so um, of, of wavelength with light penetrating the brain, um, you, you get scattering, you're limited by scattering the tissue. Above there, water, water absorbs light. And that also sort of affects it. And above about 1,300 um, nanometers, um, basically you we just sort of you're killed in effect by sort of water absorption. But the longer you go up to that, so to say it's in the 1200s, um, you can actually sort of decrease those scattering effects because um, the less, the higher the wavelength you use. And you can see deeper and deeper into the brain. Um, the problem is that previously we haven't had the right lasers and we haven't had the right fluorophores to actually look into the brain, and we basically we now do, okay? The lasers, this is a super continuum laser, we've now got them, um, and the are, you know, two very good ones uh, came out in, um, in nature over the last year, so they're really, they're really coming. And here you can see an example, imaging blood vessels in mouse brain, 
down to a millimeter in depth, which is, a, which is the thickness of the cortex in the mouse. Obviously, the human cortex is somewhat thicker, you know, far to that. Yeah, the technology is, is getting there. Um, okay, so I mentioned genetic targeting, and so for instance, we can now have genetically encoded calcium indicators. So before I was talking about putting dyes into the brain, now I'm talking about basically making viruses to put particular um, proteins into the brain which actually become a calcium sensor in themselves. This is an example one called YC360, there's another one called GCAMP3. And you can actually make them, you can, you can make such probes which will target particular types of neurons. So for instance, you might be able to, you want to target just layer four neurons in a particular area of the cortex. And then basically you can image those neurons, you'll see, you'll see just those type of neurons, so you won't be confused about uh, you know, which bits of the, the circuit you're looking at. Um, this is just showing that actually you know, these genetically encoded indicators actually let you see individual action potentials. So there's now a, basically a, a technology which has come out um, which has been transforming things in this respect, which is um, the, the Creox technology. And basically, and actually, the Allen Brain uh, Institute has been key in, uh, in developing this. So basically, they've come out with transgenic mice, which have different types of cells have, have this uh, um, enzyme creating them. And so basically, so this one's a layer four, so this, the, the cortex has six layers, okay? Um, so layer two, three being the first interesting one. And they've got like a mouse which has got layer two, three, one with layer four, one with layer five, one with layer six, and so forth. So what you can do is you can take one of those mice, and then you can make a virus which will basically put you know, your substance of interest, which it might be, for instance, this genetically encodable calcium indicator, into just the Cree neuron. So, so depending on your mouse, it will be just the layer fours or just the layer sixes and things. So we can now actually address individual elements of the of the neuronal circuit. Um, okay, so, so there are a few technologies that uh, we're using for understanding the brain, and I think they are really going to sort of transform over the next sort of five to 10 years, our understanding of how neural of how cortical circuits work. So they are very complex, but we've now got the tools to get it in a way we haven't previously. So once we can do that, what can we do with it? But we can start to interface with the brain. Um, here's actually an example from the fly brain. Um, where they've actually got a, a fly ball or a fly dialect. They've actually got a, a chip which has been made and put into the head, head capsule of the fly um, to record activity in the fly, and they've got it sitting basically mounted in a robot um, and are perturbing the sensory motor loop to understand sensory motor control um, using this, this sort of fly robot system. So this is, this is just done for understanding at, at the moment. And actually, this, is, this has been done largely with US Air Force funding. Um, what's actually quite interesting is that the US Air Force are directly funding the basic, the basic neuroscience side of this. Um, you might think it might be interested in making you know, robot killer flies or something like this. Um, at least they may be, but that's not what they're doing here. What they really want here is to uh, understand basically how the fly brain can control basically a, an aircraft which performs many orders of magnitude better than you know, any of the um, you know, the fighter jets we have at the moment. And basically it's an unstable aircraft and you have to use um, you know, basic neural control principles in order to do that. So, so they fund, funded that activity. Um, now f next I'll get to actually some stuff with humans. And this is actually the work of my colleague, Carsten Mary here. Um, we'll be able to tell you more about it as you're in the coffee break. So if you want to basically interface with the human brain, you know, you've got the choice of number of levels in which to do it. Um, so, for instance, I've sort of mentioned recording action potentials from single neurons. And actually, you know, if you want to know, if you want the, the best information, you know, that's what you would do. But, you know, you know, but, but this is hard, and this is not something that we can really feasibly do necessarily in uh, a human brain you know, you know, for practical purposes. You might record the sum of activity, or the sum of synaptic activity, the slope, um, of many neurons by some of the local field potential, having an electrode sort of deep in the brain. The next sort of level up is to record something like local field potential, but sitting on the surface of the brain, the electrode particle ground, 
And finally, you, know, you can actually look from outside the brain, things like the electron and cephalobiome. So, so these are really kind of the same kind of signals, but from different places. And the electrocorticogram is the one that's in. So you basically have to remove the skull and put some electrodes on top of the skull here, but you get much better signals. And uh, um, so he's got a number of advantages. It's, it's less invasive, okay, you, you still have to take the skull off, but, but basically you don't have to put things into the tissue which can result in sort of longer term um, sort of development of granulation tissue and, uh, and all sorts of issues. So um, it's, it's more medically justifiable. Um, you don't have to, <coughs> basically it's easier to deal with the signals. Well, so this is what it looks like. Um, so these, these are actually things done from epilepsy patients. So these patients have basically had electrocardiograms programs done to detect um, onset of, of epileptic failure. And at the same time, they've actually been used by Carsten and his colleagues for basically uh, brain machine interface purposes. So they've got this kind of grid. I think one of the things that they noted is, one of the things that they've done actually is to try and work on um, some finer grids which still, still give you exactly the same thing which you need for the epilepsy um, detection, but actually have better signals for brain machine interface work as well. And doing that. So basically, so here's an example of what you can do with it. So he's done this off with offline and online. So offline is really recording the signals and somebody can predict actually the movement that was undertaken by the patient. Um, and basically there's a nice movie of this. I will just bring up, here it is. Else. So here we've got basically the action on the predicted um, position of the hand, is it? Yeah. The hand. Here is the actual signals on the electrocorticogram. Um, and there's a, a code here which represents what we know about um, what they represent, what that area of the brain represents, basically. So basically, you can see that the ECOG signal is here, and which is which, Carson? Green is. <laughs> green is predicted. Green is predicted, yeah, right. And red is the real one, that's right, because the green is basically following the red one. Yeah. So basically, so, so he, now, he now has a version which can do this online as well, so basically in real time. So you can have, so this will start offline, but you can actually just do it, do it online. Is it today? Um, so we have rather short experimental time with these subjects because these subjects get these in, in plants for epilepsy assessment, which means we have only one or two days of experimental time with these subjects. And across these days, we don't have any strong learning effects. So I mean, maybe I'll make one remark, Sam, yeah. if you allow me to do that. Yeah. The point is here that this is about providing proof of principle or proof of concept yeah. for this technology of using um, signals from the brain surface to control the brain machine interface instead of signals which you can only record by putting electrodes into the brain. Okay? And as you saw, it's certainly not optimal, but the, the, the achievement is here to show that it can work at all, which was actually when we started this research several years ago, strongly questioned because people were thinking, we have to implant something into the brain in order to do that. But we could show that it is in principle possible, and the point here is that it's certainly not perfect, but we are using a highly suboptimal experimental setting because these electrodes are very large still and they are designed because they were designed for epilepsy assessment. Okay, which is certainly for future brain machine interface one would use much, much smaller electrodes and our results show that then one could be much, much better. And one would also use learning effects. So this is certainly what we would like to do in the future, and we are currently working together with other biomedical engineers to develop exactly this kind of small ECOG implants, which basically then, so this, is, this implant is the size of your head essentially, but we are now working on implants which have the size of your fingernail maybe, where you then basically have something like 100 electrodes on the size of your fingernail, very small electrodes, very dense in fact, and we, if we extrapolate our results that we have here with these epilepsy patients, then we could say that if we would have these small recordings, put them at the optimal place in the brain, we would do much, much better than that and could also control much higher number of degrees of freedom. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, 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 you also you then get an inverse size law because if you shrink the electrode down, you can also then focus the potential and get a much larger effect, right? Exactly, yeah. 
Okay, so finally the last few minutes, <coughs> I'm probably going to kill our time. Yeah. Um, okay, now we can do this, you may want to perturb the brain. And actually some of these technologies are actually letting us do that too. Uh, why would you want to do that? Well, I mean, Calvin and Hobbes have kind of been everywhere first. Um, you might want to make, for instance, the cerebral enhancer trial. Um, so, I think the key technology, the key advice here is I've heard in the last five years, uh, not for cerebral enhancer trials specifically, but in general for perturbing the brain, which is optogenetics. So, here what you can do is basically you can insert um, a protein, in this case it's a, a light activated channel, into a neuron. Uh, and basically, you can again, we've used the pre technology I mentioned, you can make a virus that can put it into uh, a particular type of cell, and uh, you can then spatially localize it by where you put the virus. Um, and what you can do with this is that you then, when you shine a light on it, which might be, for instance, via a laser down an optical fiber, um, you plug it into the brain, um, you can then basically insert individual action potentials into the spike transpired by neurons. So you can, you can create action potentials. Uh, now, using several other um, oxins, okay, you can do some, you can also delete action potentials. This is the one where even Arch, actually using something called Arch T, which is a, a slightly more powerful version, which you can basically, when you shine the light on, it's actually a light activated proton pump um, that hyperpolarizes the neurons, so basically pumps coming out of them, and um, you shine the light on and it shuts neurons down, you know, within milliseconds. And, uh, um, yeah, so what are we using that for? Um, I have a very nice picture here, you can't quite see the red, the uh, uh, contrast line. But basically, so what we're doing here, we're putting this into um, the secondary visual cortex here of the mouse, which most of you are actually in the primary visual cortex. Um, this is, so the red actually is all of the neurons. Um, the green here is basically the ones that have been infected by a virus. Um, we've infected layer five parameter neurons. Um, other cell bodies here, other dendrites, and then the axons come out down here. And then what we, we're doing, and this is work in progress, is to basically to knock them out at particular times in a behavioral task. Um, the main example of this, where the first one we're, we're working on, is working memory. Um, so we've got this idea that you know, to working memory is sort of the memory of the time scale of seconds that you use when we're sort of doing everyday tasks. Um, for, for the, our mouse task, this is what the mouse has to do is has to remember whether um, a stimulus, so in here was a vertical or horizontal protein, for one to two seconds um, in order to get a reward. And basically, so the stimulus comes on, there's a short delay period, and then another stimulus comes on, if they match, it gets, gets a reward. What we wanted to do here is to basically shut down the given neurons, for instance, in deep layers of visual cortex, during that delay period to probe. Um, probe by basically um, um, disrupting function um, what you know what are the neurons that are involved in storage of that memory and when are they involved specifically. So now that technique um, is actually um, basically a part of the general sort of um, technique of selective manipulation of, of cells is actually very powerful. This is an example from a collaborator of Bill Wisdom on basically again sort of making a virus. So this is a, it's an AAV virus, one of the sort of the less dangerous, I guess, types of types of virus um, that we can use use here. Um, basically, we can we can make this virus to affect a particular type of cell. And in this case, um, you can then activate it by injecting a drug. Okay, so this one is not light activated; it's drug activated, and they've made it in order to basically affect particular um, histaminergic cells involved in the sleep system. Um, with the idea, well here it's about understanding sleep, but actually um, in collaboration with some gene therapy expert at the medical school, their idea is to actually sort of bring this into, um, into potential clinical use. And speaking about the clinic, so, so one of the, the big successes, big success stories for putting things in brains is new deep brain stimulation. Um, it's, it's, been used to treat Parkinson's uh, disorder and now a bunch of other uh, disorders as well um, you know, with varying degrees of effect. Um, and you know, here's an example of basically a deep brain electrode being implanted. But what the catch is, is when we're doing this with electrodes, we don't know, we don't really understand how, how the effect is happening. We're basically you're passing a bunch of current into, into, into tissue, okay, um, and we're not really targeting the cells that we, that we want necessarily. 
Um, so the idea is you could actually use this in conjunction. So for a start, you could make an optogenetic version of this, which basically instead of your electron here, you've got multiple fiber. Um, you've basically transfected a certain class of neurons with by putting a vi injecting a virus from your initial surgery into the brain, and then basically shine you turn your laser on or all your lights. It could actually just be a one minute go and uh, and you can do the same thing in effect as the DBS electrode. Here's an even better idea, which is the DBS pill. I think for many applications this might, this might be better in the longer run. Because in this case you wouldn't need to you only need to have the initial surgery, so you have to have the virus injected. Um, and uh, basically, you know, then thereafter it would be uh, activated by a drug. So in effect, you know, after initial surgery, you would take a pill that would basically activate those particular neurons. And, you know, this is quite feasible. And in fact, there are, um, there are gene therapy trials for Parkinson's disease going on in Paris right at the moment. So basically, I didn't, you know, you know, this stuff will happen, basically, is one thing I would say. So I don't know whether these are the kind of things you might have you might have thought about. You may have been basically thinking in terms of, sort of electronic brain implants, but I think what I would suggest is the combination of sort of electronic and optical and genetic uh, implants, I think, where the field is going to go. So I'd like to end um, with another comic. Okay. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> Well, we do have some time for um, questions, so anyone who can okay, have two people here are really three. Okay, we go. Uh, I think this one is relatively straightforward. So how safe is uh, the kind of optogenetic methods? Uh, I would assume that there's a certain risk that uh, you get it in the wrong place and you might... Uh, sure. Uh, or, I mean, so far it's basically just being done in mice. Um, and for instance, the pre technology I told you about is a mouse technology. Um, and so there's a there's a, a gap there in actually the equivalent of that for for you know, for the human. I don't think it's a an unsolvable gap, but basically that's so that's one thing. So one of the things is actually so if you've got it genetically targeted, then you're not going to get it in the wrong place. I mean, you might you might inject your virus in the wrong place, in which case it's going to. Um, <coughs> you might have an effect, or you might have taken a little bit off and it won't affect those specific class of cells. So you're actually you're much better in terms of targeting. Um, one that catches is so most of the viral vectors approaches we've got at the moment um, basically wear off after some time. So you'd have to re-inject, and that's sort of again an issue um, for at least some of these kind of applications. Um, but, yeah, but technology is progressing. Yeah. <coughs> I I have a question about different stimulation yeah. field. Yeah. I mean, it's not uh, adding out different stimulation. You are putting new vitals and then you are uh, sure. activating yeah. the gene therapy. Gene therapy. Gene therapy. Gene therapy. Gene therapy. Gene therapy. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, you want to example, uh, I mean, there are some problems when you are doing optogenetics and if you think of doing optogenetics on a therapeutic basis. Yeah. And I think one of the main problems is that. Uh, Rhodopsin and daughter can be immunogenic. And okay. you can start an immunogenic reaction in the brain. Yeah. And also the vector you are using, the IAAP, yes. is strong immunogenic. Yeah, sure. So, exactly. so there, are, there are a bunch of issues, yes, uh, for getting the stuff into, into humans. So it's, it's having, I mean, the big advances at the moment are being made yeah, yeah. in a small animal, uh, basic understanding of the And that's where we were applying it. Yeah, but having said that, as I was saying, there are you now some of these gene therapy trials going on. There's one Nicholas Mazarakis. I have another question. Yeah. <laughs> it's a more general question when you are um, talking about with uh, cortical recordings, yeah. just to, make in a, to understand better the functioning of the, of the cortex of the yeah. brain and so on. Yeah. And I mean, if you go further in your, uh, in your work, you will have a huge amount of data. Yes. And uh, you are going, uh, are, how are you going to deal with it? Because, I mean, yeah, for experience, I mean, for example, yeah. for macro arrays and so on, <coughs> it's, uh, this is the problem. Yeah. It's not getting yeah. the data sometimes, it's just uh, uh, a big and, uh, In fact, that's one of the main focuses of my lab, really, is uh, I've got sort of two focuses of the lab. One is actually doing the experiments, and the other is working on what to do with the data. Um, and it is a difficult problem, a problem, as I said, because you can often come up with 
I mean, often to test a hypothesis you want to test, you might actually have to record, I mean, using the existing algorithms, record for too long, you know, in order to actually sample the data appropriately is, is often the issue. Um, and yes, there's a lot of work needed in the informatics side. And there's a lot of work ongoing in the informatics side, but there's a, a lot more needed to actually deal with the dimensionality of the data. Um, you can usually solve these problems if you can apply the appropriate constraints, so like put the appropriate prior knowledge in. Um, and then one example where this has been reasonably successful, I think, um, is, I think it was mentioned earlier, this sort of the fMRI um, sort of brain reading kind of stuff, which from a machine learning perspective shouldn't work, right? Because you've got, or from a naive machine learning perspective, shouldn't work because you know, you've got this incredibly high dimensional vaults of data set and you're taking a very small number of sort of samples, uh, of, uh, sort of trials, and you're trying to then, um, in, in effect, sort of fit this model of uh, uh, you know, predicting, um, for instance, what the person saw. Um, but it kind of does because there's, a, there's actually a large amount of um, redundancy in that, in that data set. So it actually sort of, it does work if you apply the appropriate sort of regularization constraints. So, yeah. It's brilliant. Sorry, <laughs> this brings about a lot, a lot of questions because uh, if you can get the data, let's say for humans, let's yes. say to humans or perhaps uh, non-human targets, yep. um, do you think in the future or in the future we will be able to analyze uh, this, uh, this amount of data? Will we be able to make the, uh, like the genetic um, imprint to have some uh, brain imprint, personal brain? Individual, individual, individual. Yeah. So um, from an ethical point yeah. of view, we will have yeah. uh, a discussion about uh, how we can identify people yeah. with something that will not change and that will be really, really easy to do. Yeah, um, well, I'm not really sure. I mean, one of the things I have discussed with a, a colleague in Imperial is having a basically genetic imprint of particular disease classes. Um, that can then be used, for instance, for gene therapy applications, etc. So that's kind of, it's not targeted to the actual individual, but it's targeted to subclasses of disorders, for instance. So we've gone quite as far as that. Whether you could individually target it, I don't know. I think you might end up in this messy data explosion problem, yeah. Oh, but, yeah. Okay, we have two people waiting. Uh, Helen and you, it's really a fairly simple question because you've been very, you've been using lasers and, and yeah. focus lights and stuff yeah. to actually look at things. And, I mean, lasers can be quite damaging, so <laughs> I, I just try not to look into the fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how 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 do you know, particularly when you're doing your measurements in mice, that you're not actually damaging the tissue? That you're um. Doing? Yeah. Well. I, the short answer is I think beginners might <laughs> tell us a tissue. Um, yeah. you, um, actually, one way you can tell is autofluorescence. If you damage cells, okay. um, they tend to autofluoresce. So you start to see these cells fluorescent, it shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that when you're doing this, you have to be very careful with the preparation of the surgery and so forth. And you know, a mouse, it's quite a small brain. You be very, very careful. And my suspicion is that you know, the kind of ham fisted sort of surgeries that maybe were done in the past by the people who then did you know, single unit recordings um, from individual neurons, they may have like, caused small amounts of damage and not really noticed because they weren't looking at things. But when I'm doing this energy, I can actually see because I see when there's these sort of row of cells which are sort of dead because they, you know, they've had um, the blood supply cut off or something like this. So you actually, you actually, you can actually tell because you actually get a lot of information about the circuit. But, but in that case, it's an experimental technique that maybe you could use in mice, but it's would it, it be yeah, um, to use it therapeutically or? Yeah, well, I guess I, I would originally have said, yes, we'll be limited to mice for that reason. I certainly would be volunteering to have uh, someone, um, you yeah, know, do two photo microscopy on my brain right like now. But, you know, but then you talk with the, the clinicians and it's all about, well, what's the alternative and can it, you know, what can it get us? Because if you can use this to do sort of very fine uh, scalar delineation of tumours or you know, something like this, then maybe it's worth it. And you know, the brain does have some abilities to, to self-repair and uh, uh, it may be worth it.
There's other people that in Stanford are actually trying it out. Um, yeah, we'll see how they go. Cheers, you have a question? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, Beth, a very good comment yeah. on the uh, nodes, the, uh, the electro nodes in the I think there's some work being done which you really need to make them reliable because the slightest movement will give you different signals and obviously you have yeah. different statements of those. So I'll just quickly on that. No, the real question was, um, you, you talked about you know the various sensing methods, if anything. Do you think we'd ever get to the position of actually actually identifying different cultures and the way they think? Um, and, and so think of the, the film I always think of is Firefox, you know, I think Russian. Um, I'm trying to steal the Russian air. <laughs> so do you think we'll ever get to that sort of ability to distinguish different cultures yeah. and perspectives from yeah. your, your pattern recognition um, I, I think actually, yeah, I mean, using the fMRI, so it's not actually stuff that we're doing, but the multivariate pattern analysis stuff with fMRI, I think it's pretty feasible to be honest. Yeah, it's my take on it. I mean, Carsten, do you, do you agree with that? Or? I'm not sure. I think um, I, I think there's a lot of optimism in the field that one yeah. can read out all kinds of things yeah. from from FMRI, yeah. for instance. But, yeah. but how far one can go there, I mean, one has to see, because most of these experiments that are now done are done under very constrained experimental settings, yeah. laboratory settings, yeah. like I mean, this soil lie detection experiments, for instance. And I mean, how much they can really be applied in, in practice? Yeah. So I mean, to the trouble that still remains yeah. to be shown. So. Yeah. We will, I guess we will know better in, in a couple of years. The trouble with fMRI is we're averaging together you know, many thousands of neurons uh, through the human nervous response to get this uh, signal that you're looking at. So depending on how much, if, if you've got organization, you know, organization of the information on a special scale smaller than that, you know, you're, it's not there, it's gone. Um, a lot of, uh, for instance, the things on um, the, the Jack the Lion stuff, which it's on, um, you know, playing out mood is mere seeing as basically as someone um, sort of visualizing and then you know, basically coming up with an image of what they were, they were visualizing. That actually works out a bit of a trick. It's actually, so orientation columns, orientation structure in the visual projects is smaller than this, this sort of size of, um, of voxel that I'm looking at really. But the voxels have a little residual bias of orientation left because you're not completely averaging it out, because kind of it's, it's a little bit biased. So they're basically they're picking up, up that residual signal there. So that's, so that's for that case. But yes, what if you're then looking at sort of linguistic areas of the brain and so forth? To be honest, I don't think we really have a, a good enough understanding of how the information is organized in this. Mm. One more. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, just going to echo you just remind me of what I was thinking about before. Is it really struck me that you were actually quite good at predicting whether hand joins? Yeah. Okay. But you can kind of think almost immediate kind of applications of that. And people have some sort of characteristics of the same. Yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. The MCE was not this fMRI that people were talking about. Yeah. It's a much higher spatial. So that, that's what I was talking yeah. about, the electrical one, but it just reminded me. I mean, how far away is, is actually having something like that so, so you can control it? Yeah, so I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen the equivalent with, a, with yeah. an actual implant where they've got a, a monkey and then yeah, yeah, more exactly. humans with controlling something. Yeah. So I guess what these guys are trying to do is to see, well, actually, can we, can we build the same performance with something just sitting on top of the brain rather yeah. than implanting the brain? But they've got a pretty good case of showing they can get that. Yeah.